Welcome to Coke Modular Process Systems webinar on the benefits of modularization from a risk and certainty standpoint. My name is Nidhi and I'm Coke Modular's Innovation Specialist. The format of today's webinar will be as follows, a 45 minute presentation followed by 10 minutes for Q&A and closing remarks to wrap. Please note, guys, you can ask questions at any point during the presentation using the control panel on the right side of your screen. Questions are only going to be read by the organizing team and not the entire audience. The ones we select will be addressed during our 10-minute Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, let's get started. Colleagues and friends, it is my pleasure to introduce to you this morning both Mauricio Villegas, and Jim DeNoble. Mauricio, our first speaker today, is Business Development Manager at Coke Modular. He brings with him over 25 years of experience in the engineering and construction industry. Prior to joining the company, Mauricio held various management positions at Worley, Technique, IHI EMC, and Arcadis. Mauricio has received his Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration and Management from Northeastern University. Thank you and welcome, Mauricio. Also on the presentation team, we have Jim DeNoble. Jim has over 35 years of project management experience. Prior to joining Coke Modular, Jim worked in various project and process engineering roles. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineering from the University of Delaware. Thank you, and welcome to Jim. I will Thank now you, hand it over to Mauricio. Thank you, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Nelly, for the kind introductions. Before we get started, we have two poll questions for the audience to gauge their initial view of modularization, and then a short background on Coke Modular. So if you can put up the first poll question, please, Nelly. Launching it now. Thank you. The first question we have is, do you think modularization reduces overall project risk and delivers project cost savings compared to a classic stick build? The choices are strongly agree, slightly agree, neutral, slightly disagree, or strongly disagree. We'll give you a few seconds to answer this poll question. Not sure how long it will take to answer the poll question. Um, I think we can close it now and see if we have the results. We're still collecting, Mauricio. Can I take a couple more seconds? Thanks. Uh, when it's stable for about five seconds, I'll close it out. And I think we are good. So dropping in five. And I'm about to share the results. Thank you. You want to go ahead and review those, maybe? Uh, okay, sure. So about 47% of our audience members today um, strongly agree that modularization reduces overall project risk. So I guess you're sold already. <laughs> 32% um, slightly agree and 21% neutral. So we don't have anyone that disagrees that answered. Um, and we, we look forward to speaking to you about this. I'm going to go good. ahead and hide this one. And then go ahead and start the second question. And the second question is, you know, what has been your experience with modular projects? Has it been extremely favorable, slightly favorable? Slightly unfavorable, extremely unfavorable, or not applicable. I'll give you guys a second to, to answer the question, and then I'll give you a, a, a brief kind of reasoning why these two questions were asked. A little over half the people have voted already. When you feel it's appropriate, you can go ahead and close it and um, provide the response. I'll keep it on for another 10 seconds. 
and closing now. So it looks like of the people who voted, most of them have experienced an extremely favorable experience with modular, um, with 21% never having used it, 26% slightly favorable. We've got 12% slightly unfavorable and the 3% extremely unfavorable. So thank you very much guys for your candid responses and I'll let Mauricio take over now. Are you ready for me to hide it, Mauricio? Yes, go ahead, thank you. And, and thank you for all for participating in those two poll questions. The reason why I chose those two was because even though modularization has been around for quite some time now, it's been our experience that when we meet with clients, typically you know, they evaluate uh, modularization, but either they do not choose to go with modularization or it's just a very small percentage. And I think that it's, it's, just, it's just an opinion I have is that it's, it's somewhat maybe in part due to maybe some prior experiences when modularization first you know, came about and uh, you know, there were some issues and you know, it really didn't deliver the results. So clients are somewhat maybe a little bit hesitant on, on going with modularization or you know, they're, they're, you know, they know field construction, they know stick build, so they go with what they know. So you know, we're, we're, we're not seeing the amount of modularization going forward as we would expect it to. And so that's why I was just curious about those questions. So thank you. So just, a, just to start off with just a, a quick overview on who Coke Modular is. As the name implies, we are part of the Coke Lich family and a joint venture with Coke Lich. And we have uh, 30 years experience in the industry as Coke Modular and our partners and Coke Lich heritage at several decades beyond that. We predominantly support the chemical processing industry. We're active in many others. Um, listed are various industries we support and a broad view of the applications we get involved with, such as product purification, chemical reactions, uh, steam stripping, different types of vacuum distillation, wastewater treatment, and whatnot. Our capabilities can be categorized into three buckets. Our core capability is process engineering. That's where it all starts. Our sweet spot is non-ideal mixtures and breaking azeotropes. Clients bring us in to tackle their toughest purification and recovering problems. Uh, these typically involve us either upstream or downstream operations. Uh, we're also a leader in liquid to liquid extraction and the sole provider of coke lift technology such as the car and the Scheibel columns. Supporting engineering is our pilot plant located here in Houston. Uh, where we can run real world experiments. Um, our plant remains active all year round. Our clients come to us to validate their process models or generate data that's not available you know, through publications. This also allows us, allows us the, the possibility of providing a process performance guarantee as well as scaling up and commercializing pilot systems. Eventually, all our work manifests itself into modular process systems. We deliver all our projects modularly. This allows us to mitigate delivery risk and offer project certainty to our clients through a lump sum contracting model. Our modularization expertise coupled with our process design expertise is where we differentiate ourselves from other EPCs and fabricators. Most EPCs either maintain a large field construction arm which may or may not have a modularization capability. However, their primary delivery model is and most uh, profitable is the field construction side of things. But furthermore, you know, most EPCs are geared towards larger projects. And when they do modularize, they typically tend to be mega modules, uh, which may or may not be fabricated domestically or in yards overseas. Fabrication, on the other hand, typically do not have any or very limited uh, engineering capability. And for the most part, we probably don't have uh, a strong process engineering capability. For as a Coke module, we bring over 30 years experience in process design, not only design process and solve design process challenges and pilot test uh, proof of concept, but also have the know-how how to translate that process design into the most efficient economical and ergonomic modular system. So before we get into the benefits of modularization, Let's go over the different types of modules, as I found that there are varying perceptions of what modularization is. 
Perception, perceptions range from a basic pallet size skid to mega modules shipped on barges overseas, and there's hardly much in between. So, for example, according to CII, the Construction Industry Institute, they define modularization as you know, entailing a large scale transfer of stick build construction effort from the job site to one or more local or distant fabrication shops in order to exploit one or more strategic advantages. So the key distinctions I'd like to point out here is first is it requires a large scale transfer of stick build construction. And second, we want to exploit one or more strategic advantages. But having said this, I'd like to um, talk about what a module is. So a module is defined as a major section of a plant resulting from a series of remote assembly operations and may include portions of many systems, usually the largest transportable unit or component of a, of a facility. So having said this, I'd like to make a further distinction. When it comes to modules, there are basically two classes of modules, mega modules and truckable modules. Now, if you recall from our definition, modularization entails a large scale transfer of stick fill construction offsite. Therefore, skids do not fall into a module class. Sometimes people will describe a module as a skid. However, there is a great difference between a skid and a module. Typically, a skid is just that. Imagine a metal pallet in which equipment is bolted onto it. These are very basic and typically only carry ancillary equipment. For example, a pump skid. And when we look at mega modules, you know, as I mentioned before, some individuals may have been involved in large projects in which they may have fabricated mega modules, such as the one shown here. You are typically fabricated overseas in places like Korea, the Philippines, uh, China, and whatnot. And they take advantage of lower labor costs and material costs. However, mega modules, uh, domestic capabilities have been more available and prevalent here in the United States uh, domestically as well. Historically, there's been a debate on the actual benefit derived from mega modules. Uh, especially, this is due to uh, costs associated with transportation. Uh, project oversight required um, at the uh, fabrication sites, rework, and whatnot. So in the past, offshore modularization did not provide that cost savings that we were anticipating, and there were uh, overruns. So that's why you know, individuals that may have been involved on these projects in the past may have a sour taste in their mouth based on you know, these mega modules that you know, created, fabricated early on when modularization was just getting started. So I think there's there's definitely a need to have a clear distinction on the differences between a mega module and a truckable module, which we'll be talking about next. Now, truckable modules are an alternative class of modules which can aid in the transfer, again, of large scale stick build construction efforts off site and exploit some of these strategic advantages that we'll talk about shortly. But modular, our execution model, our execution model revolves around truckable modules. These are typically fabricated here in the United States, are shipped to site, uh, shipped to site on truck, and they're probably about 90% completed. Now, truckable modules can be employed to support various stages of project development. For example, at Coke Modular, we get involved in projects very early on supporting clients in the design and commercialization of novel technologies. On such projects, we can design either a pilot scale project or a demonstration, demonstration scale uh, process system which can then easily be scaled up to production scale as the project progresses. And when we look at uh, production scale modules, these systems can be as simple as a single module as we see on the left-hand side, or as complex as a multi-process uh, system greenfield project as we see on the right, or sometimes somewhere in between what we have here in the center picture, which is a brownfield project comprising of four process modules and a stair module. And we look at fabrication. So to fabricate a truckable module, these systems are built in a controlled assembly line fashion that helps minimize the amount of work and resources needed as compared as a, a field construction site. The structural steel frame serves as a shipping support and provides access to equipment during normal operation and maintenance for, for maintenance purposes. After the process equipment is installed within the structural frame, the piping components, field instrumentation, Electrical wiring is then completed. 
It's also typical for items like tracing, thermal insulation, lighting, control systems, uh, fire protection to be install, installed at this point as well. Upon completion, a rigorous testing program is conducted on all these systems and components uh, prior to shipping to the field. Now let's have a, have a look at the, uh, now that we have a common understanding of what modularization is, let's look at how going modular can help mitigate project risk and deliver project certainty. While the overall benefits discussed next may apply to both classes of modules, during today's discussion, we're going to focus on truckable modules, uh, as these are the ones that, you know, truck module is most familiar with and, and is part of our delivery model, and also the delivery model, which we've developed over the past 30 years. So before we begin, let's look at some recent events which have shaped the project delivery landscape. So with COVID impacting our industry and our ability to deliver projects, many EPCs are exiting the competitive EPC lump sum contracting business. So for example, Floor just recently announced a, about a month or so ago that they were exiting the EPC lump sum uh, contracting business, basically citing that there was you know, increased project risk, a transactional marketplace, and also some market uncertainty driven by the COVID-19 pandemic. And a few weeks before Floor made such an announcement, KBR made a similar announcement. Having said this, Coke Modular has no intention on exiting the competitive EPC lump sum business, and we're very confident in our ability to manage our project risk, and we'll, con we'll continue offering this lump sum projects, uh, whether COVID or not. Uh, another, another factor to discuss is also that owners are moving towards smaller projects which require less capex and deliver a quicker ROI. These types of projects lend themselves very well to truckable modules, such as those uh, produced by Coke Modular. So therefore, now and ever, there's more reasons to consider modularization as a project delivery model. So let's talk about what those benefits are. If you, if you recall from our CI definition of modularization, we're employing modularization as a delivery model to exploit one or more strategic advantages uh, over traditional stick build construction. These typical, uh, these typical uh, drivers would be geographic location. So, for example, the plant uh, offer if the plant site offers limited resource avail availability. We might you know want to modularize if there's a schedule driven project uh, where you know might be uh, you know time to market is critical or permitting is on the critical path. And that might be a benefit. Uh, there might be brownfield site constraints such as ongoing simultaneous operations or restricted site access, that might be another factor. Cost and schedule certainty. So for example, if you're seeking uh, project funding, you might look for modularization and get lump sum pricing early on. And then now COVID, for example, if you wanna minimize uh, risk exposure uh, to the pandemic. These are all you know, benefits. So if we, if we dig a little bit deeper, deeper so from a health and safety perspective, we're looking at reducing workplace hazards and injury, reducing illness from a completion risk. You know, a controlled environment is going to help you increase your productivity, provide schedule improvement, minimize interruptions to site operations, and you can also uh, proceed with construction while you're waiting on permitting. On the contract side, you know, you can transfer a lot of that risk over to the uh, to the module fabricator. Uh, you're getting performance guaranteed, and you're also getting single source responsibility. And then ultimately, from a commercial perspective, you know, you're, you're, you're getting an advanced, uh, definitive investment estimate early on. Uh, you're getting fixed pricing, and then you're getting an overall cost savings. So these are many of the benefits that come along with modularization. So I should note that, you know, there are some, a few recurring arguments against modularization, which we should discuss. So, you know, some of the arguments that we hear often is there is an additional cost related to structural steel. There is additional structural steel uh, included. You know, this is for bracing for transportation and installation. However, you know, this bracing is removed uh, at site after installation. Uh, there's also a perceived disadvantage of an increased engineering cost. Um, I would say that, you know, there have been instances where there is an increased Cost associated to engineering. If you're going with an engineering firm that's maybe doesn't have familiarization with with modularization or or, or, or very new in the game, 
you know, with Cook Modular, we've been doing this for 30 years, so we've already optimized our, our, our design and engineering, you know, it's very minimal additional engineering required. Another thing that people mention is, you know, design, you know, freezing design early on. Uh, that is true. We need to freeze that design so we can get, uh, get, the, get the modules into the, into the fab shops and get started. That's how we gain some of those schedule improvements. But I think, that, you know, we do have uh, a robust change management uh, program. So throughout the different stages of, of design, we do reviews. And, and as long as there is a material change, you know, you still have the opportunity to incorporate some changes. But what this also does is if you're freezing the design early, you're basically uh, having a, a very lean and fit for purpose design. And then you're also avoiding uh, these change orders that you're gonna get out in the field and, and, and basically drive additional costs. So there are, are, are definite uh, advantages to freezing the design early. And then the other thing we also hear about is an increase in transportation costs. Being that these are truckable modules, there is a, an additional transportation cost, but it's, it's very minimal. I would say that we typically range between three to four percent transportation cost, and that's the cost of the module, not of the total PIC. I want to make that clear. And then also we do this as a pass-through cost, so there's no markup, and, and those services are provided by us. That's just part of the project. So ultimately, I think the benefits and the overall cost savings far exceed the incremental cost associated with this additional structural steel or transportation cost. So here we have, you know, the typical stage gate that you know we all work to. Um, you can see the cost influence and the project expenditure curves how they cross, and we're all familiar with this. I'm sure that most of us can agree that with this concept, that the earlier you get involved in a project, the uh, the more value that you can provide and the greater influence to control costs. Um, so you know, this is kind of your typical uh, stage gate process. So here we're looking at kind of a variation of that. And what we've done is we've taken this traditional stage gate process and applied it to this, uh, to our code to modular, uh, modular delivery model. And so by, by executing projects to a modular delivery model, project completion schedules can be dramatically short. So for example, a, a, a project uh, that was conceived concept to, uh, to delivery on site can be delivered, you know, if it's a small project, eight to nine months, a larger project, maybe 20 or more modules, you're looking at 14 to 18 months delivery time from, from starting engineering to having modules on site. And Jim will be speaking uh, to, a, to one of these large projects and, uh, and talking about how we met schedule. So really a considerable difference. So ultimately by getting us involved early on in FDL one and two, we can definitely provide a greater value in, in the design and really help in aiding aiding that overall uh, lowering of, of uh, capital costs. So as we saw on the previous slide, you know, the earlier we get involved in the design phase, again, the greater value and cost savings. So when it comes to modularization, early critical success factors include, you know, really, you know, determining that, that preliminary module definition, understanding the, uh, the envelope limitations of where these modules are gonna sit, design optimization, uh, identifying and ordering long lead equipment items, and also taking into consideration the operations and maintenance, and making sure that, that operators can get in there and operate and maintain these modules. Um, so, you know, during this, you know, initial stage, you know, Coke modular engineers will evaluate the site condition, the accessibility, provide the most efficient layout based upon, you know, these 30 years of uh, optimization experience. Well, uh, applying such experience enables us to minimize their overall site footprint, while ensuring constructability, operability, and maintainability. Additionally, at this point, you know, Cook modular estimators and supply chain management will utilize an extensive database of recent projects, as well as hard quotes, to generate preliminary and definitive cost estimates, thus enabling owners to make FID decisions much earlier. Um, you know, before I joined Cook modular, I, was, I, I worked for many EPCs and one of the things I realized, you know, when I came to Coke Modular is that we were definitely able to provide, you know, definitive uh, cost estimates and lump sum prices much earlier because we were going modular than if I was at an EPC doing cost reimbursable projects. 
So when considering and designing truckable modules, there are a few design considerations which need to be taken into account since these modules need to both fit on a truck and then you know, be able to be transported down the road. So these considerations are you know, the overall module footprint. We're looking at a 12 by 14 footprint. The overall height of an individual module basically tops out about 80 to 90 feet. And the individual module weight tops out about 100 tons, sometimes a little bit old. But more than that, depending on the vehicles that we're using and the roads that we'll be traveling. Some of the other limitations are the equipment sizes. So, for example, columns, reactor, key exchangers, these have to fit within a module. So, we're looking at a maximum of about six and six feet, six inches. And with tanks, we you know a bit larger, you're probably looking at a 10 foot diameter tank that can fit within a module. There are exceptions to this, there are hybrids, which we'll talk about next. And when we talk about hybrids, you know, when we look at truckable modules, these are extremely customizable to suit the project-specific needs. And so, for example, uh, on the left-hand side, we look at instances where a column or a vessel diameter does, cannot be placed within a module footprint. We can design a, a system in which the, the column resides on the outside of the, of the module. So we'll have these fabricated off-site, and once the module is set in place, We'll ship the, the columns and, and have those set freestanding next to, next to the module. Now, on the right-hand side, you see a different format. You'll, these, these columns were actually uh, set in place within the module, so the module were set in place. And then uh, we had a 120-foot column basically dropped into, into the module. So that's uh, another variation. Other hybrid variations include uh, stacking modules, so not only can modules be uh, stacked side by side like Legos, but they can be stacked one on top of the other. We've never had to really go over two modules, uh, um, module height. Uh, what you're looking at here is we also had a 120 foot tall column. Um, and these were spread between two modules and basically flanged together when the, when the uh, modules were, were stacked on top of each other. Now on the right hand side, you know, we can apply you know, aluminum siding and roofing in case you know, there's inclement weather or there's uh, a need for protecting the IP. Here I just want to walk you through uh, uh, the design evolution of a typical module before it gets frozen. You can clearly see you know, early on, you know, you're, you're just basically framing out the module and showing where the major vessels are included and, and, and just kind of walk, walk through the process until you have a fully detailed design. Other things that we do is you know, during 3D modeling, you know, there's, there's 3D model reviews, which everyone's familiar with, where we're involving key stakeholders, reviewing operability and maintainability to make sure that uh, you know, these modules are fit for purpose on site. One of the things that we, we've heard from many of our clients is that when we deliver our modules, and sometimes these modules reside in, 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 in facilities where other parts of the facility have been stick built, they sometimes say that. Now, these modules sometimes feel like there's more space and, and have more ample room than the traditional stick fill. So, so yeah, there's no concerns there. Now, as the project progresses and we get into the design build phase, the benefits of fabricating offsite at a fabrication shop versus a, versus the field become to begin to materialize. And these critical success factors include contractor leadership, experience, and management of execution risks. Uh, module fabricator uh, capabilities have to be taken into consideration and a timely design, design freeze. <clears throat> I mentioned project management here because managing a modular project is quite different than managing a field directed project. On a modular project, you're managing a, 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 the fabrication, the design that was frozen very early and within a, a predefined lump sum price. So you don't have the luxury of making changes as you go along or recovering from unplanned costs and change work. Uh, furthermore, modular projects move at a much faster pace uh, due to increased worker productivity and an assembly line methodology. Therefore, if you don't consistently monitor progress, disruptions can quickly snowball. Therefore, activities really need to be planned and managed effectively as any delay could have a knockdown effect on cost and schedule. When it comes to fabricators and vendors, again, it's important to only utilize companies that have an extent that have extensive experience delivering modules and that you've worked with in the past and have a long-term working relationship with the project team. 
For example, at Coke Modular, our network of fabricators and vendors is based upon a qualification process evolved over the last 30 years. And many of our strategic contractors we've been working with for years uh, really operate as an extension of our organization. So now let's look at you know, a typical work site. What are the differentiators? So when we look at um, you know, a typical field construction site, you know, it could be, you know, depending on the size of the project, you could have hundreds to maybe even thousands of workers at one time on a site. Whereas in a typical fabrication shop, and you can spend the work in, in either one fabrication shop or multiple fabrication shops. Our shops typically average under 100. Some of the really large fab shops have maybe 200, 250, but our typical ones are about 100. And if you look at the differences, you know, as you can see, you know, we're, we're always working on the horizontal um, stick build. I mean, you're basically building up. Um, the differences are, you know, we're in a controlled environment. Uh, you know, you have this assembly line fabrication methodology, which helps reduce workplace hazards and increase productivity. You also have a reduced uh, field construction workforce. As we mentioned, about 90% of the fabrication is completed offsite. So really you just need enough field staff to help with setting the modules and doing all the tie-ins. And then you also gain the greater productivity, which, which equates to cost savings and schedule improvement. And then one other thing I'll point out is in the fab shops, you're gonna get a consistent workforce. Um, you know, a, a typical, uh, construction site, you know, you might get travelers, you might get, uh, you might be bringing in a workforce and you might have construction workers that are following projects and trying to chase, you know, the, the most dollars for, for a project. Whereas in a, in, a, in a fabrication shop, I mean, these are individuals that are you know, working the same job, family's important, they want to stay close to home. So it's, it's a more consistent, different, different mentality to work. So I just want to walk you through, you know, basically the, the different steps of assembly. The fabrication typically begins with the assembly of a steel frame structure and the assembly of, of the spool pieces. Again, here you can see how everything is being assembled in the horizontal, allowing for a safe and efficient assembly. Once the sealed structure has been assembled, we can start installing equipment. Again, as you can see, everything is in the horizontal. We have an overhead crane, which can facilitate moving equipment around. Really, the highest you're going to be working on is a step ladder. Um, then, additionally, at this point, we can start installing vessels. Uh, if the vessels are longer than a single module, as we discussed before, you know, we'll actually do that in the shop. We'll line up the, the, the two modules. We'll flange those together so that they can you know, make sure there's a proper fit, and we can do the testing afterwards. Next, all the piping will get installed. And uh, everything is, as you can see, everything is, you know, very easily accessible and very safe condition. Uh, here we can see, you know, then the electrical and instrumentation is being installed. It's also typical, you know, we'll install tracing, thermal insulation, lighting, control systems, safety showers, fire protection. Like I said, about 90% of the module is, is completed by the time we were ready to ship. And these will all be FAT tested. We'll basically test them up to a point where other, other than basically putting, you know, product in it, you know, we'll do hydro testing when I will be fully tested. Uh, so I just want to make that, that comment. Uh, and then ultimately, and here we see a, a fully completed module ready for transportation to site. Uh, I'll cover transportation on the next slide. So once fa uh, fabrication is complete, the modules are ready to be transported. You know, we still have a few critical factors. You know, that would be, you know, transportation capabilities and making sure that we avoid delays. But up, to this, up to this point, we've designed and fabricated our modules, we've managed our risks, and we're on time. So the last thing we want to do is blow everything during transportation and installation. Because if you hire the wrong transportation company, you can run the risk of damage. Um, there are some instances where clients have, have opted to take on transportation on their own, and you know, we've had issues where, you know, they've hit, uh, you know, overpasses with a module. So then they, they, they say, you know, all right, you know, next one's you've got this. So, so from that point forward, you know, we pretty much, I would say 99% of the time, we handle all the transportation. So you don't want to have, you know, damage during transportation, or you don't want to have uh, delays during transportation. Because that site, you could have a crew, you could have cranes, you know, these, these, uh, these are costly items, and you don't want to delay time. You don't want to stand by cost. 
So you really want to make sure that you, know, you, you have a company that use company that's familiar with modules, familiar with, uh, with freight folders that can safely and efficiently you know, transport these. And as I mentioned, you know, this is a pass-through cost for us, so there's no additional cost for us to manage that or place those orders. So as the name implies, these modules are, are truckable, truckable modules, but at the same time, they can be shipped on a barge or shipped worldwide if required to be doing these you know, anywhere in the world. So once the modules are shipped to site, depending on the size of the modular system and or construction sequencing, these modules are set, you know, in place here on the left-hand side, you can see the foundations waiting for, for modules. Or on the right-hand side, you can see a staging area where they're placed on cans. The funny anecdote here is, you know, we, like I mentioned before, you know, we deliver our projects lump sum. You know, we're typically being managed against the cost and schedule and with either LDs or other types of penalties if we don't meet cost and schedule. And invariably, it never fails that, you know, we'll run, 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 meet schedule, meet cost, and then we'll get the call and say, oh, you know, you know, construction is not ready to receive the module, so can you hold off shipping these or can you store these for us a little while while we get everything ready for you? So, you know, and Jim will talk about this as well. I mean, we're constantly faced with, you know, we're either on schedule or ahead of schedule. So that's one of the advantages modularization. So once these modules are set on their foundation, they're anchored for stability. Now the remaining effort is basically performing tie-ins and uh, basically you know, doing any other types of electric connections. We typically ship our, our modules with control systems already in place. You really just need to run an Ethernet cable and you're good to go. Here's a great picture of an ExxonMobil project we did here on the Gulf Coast. Uh, you can see you know, pretty, you know, it's a brownfield site, you know, tight quarters. We brought in, looks like, you know, you've got three process modules and a steer module. Um, this was all done, this was, you know, basically, you know, brought in, set, installed, all in one day. Now, when it comes to delivering results, you know, just talk a little bit about statistics. Industry shows, industry shows about an average of a 20% increase in cost when you look at uh, modules, but when I want to really qualify it, qualify it because you know really they look at mega modules compared to stick bills, so they say, oh, that's a 20% cost increase of going modular. But when we look at truckable modules, our experience is you're actually seeing a 10 to 30% uh, decrease in cost if you go truckable versus maybe a typical mega module. And then just uh, from talking about modularization in general, you know, there is a productivity uh, advantage. You know, in a fabrication shop, we can see a productivity rate of about a 0.75 uh, average, sometimes a little bit lower than that. Whereas in the field, you know, depending on the craft and also depending on what the location factor is, you can look at anything greater than one to even a greater than two. A good example of this is welding. Um, you know, welding productivity in the field you know, is probably one year higher, higher productivity rates, whereas uh, in the uh, fabrication shop, you know, like I said, we average 0.75. That's because we're doing bench welding compared to field welds, so you're getting a lot, a uh, much better uh, weld acceptance rate in the fab shop. So now that I've discussed uh, basically the overall benefits of modularization and how this application can really help mitigate risk and deliver project certainty, I'd like to give Jim the opportunity to walk you through one of his recent projects that he's been involved with as a real world example. And Jim will be presenting an, ex an excerpt from a presentation presented by Camores and Coke Modular at a prior Kirk conference. Thank you. Jim, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mauricio. I think you need to. Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay, I believe I've got it now. And thank you. Okay, uh, this is the slide from the uh, Construction Users Roundtable uh, that was presented by uh, Tom Schaefer of Coke Modular back in 2018. And I've included this uh, just because it's uh, a testament to the customer's satisfaction. Uh, we're proud to uh, work with um, Camores in presenting this information uh, to industry. 
Uh, here's a summary of uh, Project Chill uh, from Comores. It's a 15 module project. It was 14 to 16 months um, over uh, detailed engineering and module fabrication. Uh, these modules were delivered back in uh, April of 2018. Uh, we were a late addition into this project. The customer was potentially looking at uh, doing this project stick built, and they were evaluating the advantages of module fabrication versus stick built, uh, the needs to uh, start foundation work, uh, air permit receipts, and the advantages for the, the, the customer was allowing uh, the fabrication to begin prior to the air permit receipt and prior to uh, foundation completion. So we're having module construction in progress during that time. Benefits to the customer, uh, significant savings in lost revenue. They were bringing a new product to market in this case. Uh, we started the project by getting all their fears and concerns on the table, uh, understanding the viewpoint of all the stakeholders on the project from the customer's project team. Um, they'd never worked with a module company that had performed the process engineering as well as the uh, pr uh, production design and engineering. They are concerned about sufficient space for operability and maintenance, uh, concerned the ground floor, uh, wanted to have, have it be concrete and free of any equipment support steel. They had a vision of modules that would be on their site that would be similar to stick built uh, surrounding uh, uh, equipment that they had. Um, they did have previous experience with, uh, with module fabrication, uh, but they didn't have good experience with module fabrication. So we were basically overcoming the problems that they had identified uh, with module fabrication right from the start of the project. Concerns about interior cross bracing uh, would interfere with access and movement. Concern with uh, movement uh, egress between the modules on all floor levels of the modules. So I, I mentioned this is the, the concerns and fears of all the stakeholders on the pro customer's uh, project team. Uh, and then looking at uh, for Coke Modular, we're mitigating the project risk. We're monitoring cost, schedule, and performance. And we have basically, from a project management standpoint, our project management toolboxes, including, let's say, the advantages of a fixed price proposal uh, that's controlling the cost of the project and rigid change order procedures to make sure that change orders are presented and authorized by the appropriate representatives on the customer's side. Uh, but the revisions to scope that could affect the cost and delivery of the project are, are very carefully controlled. We have a project schedule. Uh, in this specific project, it was 465 tasks involved in the uh, construction of these modules for the customer. Uh, the performance that I'm referencing here and monitoring performance is our quality control and our adherence to the customer's project specifications. Uh, we have periodic meetings with the customer develop action item list, project reporting. These are, say, common uh, methods that are used to control the uh, uh, risk of any, any project anywhere. But these, uh, these are issues that are done through the, through the Coke Modular project. But we also have you know, experience in developing these tools over many years of project, uh, project work. Uh, document submittals, I'll, I'll reference that uh, the coordinated effort between Coke Modular and our customer in having uh, review by the customer approvals and then uh, any revisions associated with the customer comments. Um, we're needing the cooperation of our customers to be able to work, work through uh, reviews and approvals efficiently and on schedule. Um, design review meetings could be looking at uh, equipment design as well as a, a, a 3D model for the overall module and the piping system. Uh, inspections, that could be inspections at our fabrication shops for, uh, let's say, a pressure vessel uh, or inspections at the module assembly shop where the uh, uh, module is being uh, assembled. Uh, factory acceptance testing is the last uh, activity in our module assembly shop where the customer is working alongside of us as we power up the uh, uh, instrumentation and controls and test the operation of valves, test the uh, instrumentation to confirm that there's no defects as we power up the system. And that's typically our customer's uh, final inspection also and in, uh, right before preparation for shipment and, and release for shipment of the completed modules to the site. Uh, here's a view of the overall uh, uh, CAD Works model, the 3D model that was used for this project. And there were several review meetings through the course of the project. Uh, we visited the customer's uh, site 
uh, and did meetings with the uh, customer's operations uh, personnel, maintenance personnel, at project and project uh, personnel. Uh, I wanted to mention also that we refer to the 3D model also on the module assembly floor shop. And that's really been a more recent development in our module assembly uh, shops, having this model available for the uh, uh, pipe fitters and, and uh, workers on the module assembly uh, can help avoid confusion in interpreting a complex piping isometric. Um, understanding the uh, uh, customers' needs is, is one way that we're mitigating the project risk. And here there were concerns from the customer about the design of the ground floor of the module. And these were, were identified early on in the uh, uh, project. As I mentioned, we were getting all of the risks and concerns, uh, all, all of their, their concerns on the table. And a knowledgeable customer who understands what they want and what they don't want is certainly helpful in avoiding any misunderstanding and, and uh, corrections needed or, or rework. Uh, on the ground floor of the modules, we had some special construction here. A traditional module with uh, steel on the, what's the zero, zero level, the top of steel uh, at, at the bottom level of, of the module and grading. And here in this case, uh, we, we put in some temporary steel that was removed at site. And uh, uh, this is a picture of the finished uh, module for Project Chill. Uh, and you can see the pumps were also on these uh, jack stands with uh, um, to, to level out the pump while it's sitting on a foundation at site. And we used temporary steel to support the pump while we were in the module assembly shop. And here's a, a view of the temporary steel that was used in our 3D model. And you can see removable pieces for the pump support um, that were removed after the module was erected at site. Um, the layouts of the process equipment and piping also include layouts of the, the main control panels with uh, uh, IO installed. And we also planned for a uh, spare future modifications, be it uh, on module or in the surrounding areas off module. So if there was some equipment that was needed to be added in or planned for a future expansion off module, we may use spare IO on the module in order to uh, bring that back in, into the control system. Uh, understanding the customer's needs on the upper levels of the floors of the modules, some concerns that were brought to, uh, to our attention in the, in the early stages of the project. And then the following slides will identify how we uh, mitigated the project risk uh, by integrating operability into the design of the modules. And here on the left, we've got the, their uh, SIS panels that they wanted to have for safety instrumented systems, you know, 120 volt uh, power panels there. Uh, layouts of this relative to, to, to meet their needs. Uh, and on the right, uh, showing the uh, openings for a manway into a column and some of the uh, piping that was on the module. Uh, every line, every instrument, every valve is reviewed with the customer during the model review meeting. And this communication and common understanding of the uh, design of the module helps to avoid uh, confusion. Uh, we also perform a lighting study. You can see the light plates in here to make sure that we had adequate lighting for uh, safe egress and access on the modules. Uh, some other examples here of the uh, open concept that was used. And remember, we were trying to replicate some of the uh, stick built construction that the customer was familiar with and having this uh, open modular concept. Uh, uh, the the positions for the safety shower, having consistent positions inside of multiple modules for the safety showers uh, helps to uh, enhance the safety. If some operator is trying to remember the location of the safety shower, if you say temporary blinded and needed need to access the safety shower, putting this on the same locations on the floor helps for the overall project safety. And then the utility stations here were planned out based upon the needs for I'll say you'll know, compress there for a maintenance access or, or the hose reels for, for any of the maintenance activities that would be needed for uh, module maintenance. Um, here, looking at the operability and, and potential maintenance needs, uh, here a diagonal brace was originally uh, in the design of the module and it was needed while the module was uh, assembled horizontally and then erected vertically, but then after the modules at site, that brace could be removed, allowing access to the bonnet of the heat exchanger and increasing the space to be able to walk between the modules. Uh, small items here relating to uh, uh, pe penetrations in the floor. Um, 
we added in some additional toe plates that are above and beyond the code requirements here, but ultimately this uh, minimizes the risk of small items that would fall between, let's say, uh, the edge of the grating and the outside edge of, of insulation on the insulated piping uh, in the modules. Improves the, the finished appearance of the modules and uh, um, overall uh, uh, help, helps with the uh, uh, customer satisfaction. Uh, here, there were concerns about uh, safety relating to module egress uh, that were brought to our attention early on. Uh, the two, two means of egress between the modules and uh, stairs on either end, walkways uh, between the modules on two, two sides. And we uh, increased the opening in the walkways uh, between the modules here. We've got a five foot four inch, or five foot four and an eighth inch opening uh, between the walkways uh, to understand the customer's uh, maintenance and uh, uh, access needs. So we wanted to uh, carry that forward and modify the design for the walkways between the modules to meet the customer's needs. Uh, some other views of the walkways between the modules. And again, we were keeping that, that vision of what the customer expected uh, right from the start of the project and, and, and addressing their concerns. Uh, added in some notes about here's a view of the um, uh, completed modules on site and our consulting engineering services that we would provide during the installation of the modules uh, can help alleviate any confusion or risk of delay during the installation of the modules. And then uh, once the modules are erected on site, uh, the uh, services associated with uh, consulting services for process engineering or instrumentation and, and controls uh, engineering support during the commissioning uh, can help minimize the delays and get the process operating quick, quickly and get the uh, equipment meeting the performance specification uh, for the customer. Uh, overall, is a very successful uh, project in this case uh, um, relative to the, the measurements for cost, schedule, overall performance uh, on the project. We turned over the facility in advance of the completion of the main facility, going back to what Mauricio mentioned earlier. Frequently, uh, we, we have our, our module projects uh, delivered to the site and the surrounding equipment is, is falling uh, behind schedule, but we've got the modules erected uh, on schedule and, and moving forward. Uh, we, we achieved overall savings over the stick build options that the customer was initially considered. And the customer was ultimately uh, very happy with the performance on this project and chose Coke Modular for two future projects. Okay, I think I'll hand back um, to Mauricio. And you need to leave that slide on there. Um... That's me, right? Okay. Great. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the last poll question to make sure that we have some time for, for Q&A. So, Nidhi, if you want to start off with some, you know, building some questions. Sure. Um, we have time for two questions. If people want to stay longer, we could do a third. But let me start with the first one. And before I go there, I'll just say that um, we were asked if we would send out the presentation and that will go out into the thank you email. All right, so our very first question, which I am displaying to the entire group was, you mentioned you prefer to be engaged early on in the design process. What if the owner has already advanced their design? Thank you. Um... I'll, I'll take that one. I would say that we get involved, you know, our preference is, of course, to get involved early on in projects because, as we discussed, you know, you, you provide the greatest value there. But that's not to say that clients sometimes come to us with a, uh, with a PDP and say, can you take this design and go forward with it? Um, so we, we do get involved in that case. I think uh, the Camorras project is a good example of that, where they had a PDP already. Uh, we did opt to do a, a short engineering, uh, value engineering study on that. We were able to actually optimize the design a little bit further and remove some additional some equipment uh, and, and reduce some of the cost. So we, 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 we can do that. I will say that we're not just the fabrication shop. We're not just going to you know, take an order to fabricate a module. Uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, our, our, our key differentiators are 
our process engineering capability and modularization. So it's kind of, they kind of go both hand in hand. Uh, Jim, anything you want to add there? I'd say in addition to, let's say, process optimization, uh, heat integration studies and improving the overall efficiency of heat recovery uh, is one of the advantages in, in, in doing that type of a, a process study early on. So a customer can, can come to us with that, that type of a request. Mm -hmm. right, thank, thank you very you. much, guys. Um, the next question, which I am displaying up on the screen now in your control panel is, do you provide module instruction, installation services at site? I'm sorry, do you provide module installation services at site? Um, we don't do installation. Um, you know, I did cover installation on the, on the slide deck, but that's not performed by us. We typically, our scope of supply ends at, at delivery. Um, we provide on-site uh, consulting services. Uh, and we'll provide uh, yeah, consulting services. But we typically work with either the owners, um, you know, in-house uh, field services team, or like implant services, or they might have it might be a part of a larger project and work with their EPC. Uh, I would say that if the client is looking for a turnkey solution, we could always involve our sister company called Project Solutions where they can take on the installation, any OSBL or, or modules that are not truckable and would be a, a large one where they can handle that. So we'd probably involve them to provide a turnkey solution. Uh, Jim, anything you want to add there? Uh, no, I, I think you've covered it well. Any other question? Maybe I think I have to one more. Okay, I will display that on the screen. Um, Give me one second. It is as follows. Is there an addition, additional class of modules which are smaller than truckable, which enable flexible production in lower scale sectors such as pharma or fine chemicals? Uh, Jim, you want to take that or you want me to take that Yeah, I'm, well, I. I'm not sure that I understand the question correctly, but a smaller scale, like if, if Mauricio was looking at, the, say, uh, uh, the skid pictures, and we have we have done work with smaller modules, so say uh, modules where you're dealing with process tubing, and you're you're in a demonstration plant, and you're you're working with very small capacities, or in farm in the pharmaceutical industry also uh, some high value products with uh, low low flow rate and smaller equipment, and we have built. Uh, small demonstration plants, uh, pilot plants uh, um, for for those needs. So I think in that scale, we have done that work uh, as well as the larger modules that were part of the presentation that I just went through. Right, and good point. Uh, we, we work with a lot of emerging technology providers where you know they they really just have this whole proof of concept. You know, trying to get funding for a commercial scale. We get involved with uh, you know, relatively small pilot scale systems, uh, and so you yeah, definitely can support. You know, I showed you one picture of, of a one module, but that one module can be up to 80 feet. That doesn't mean it can be you know, 20 feet. You know, so so or 10 feet. So so it's, it's you know basically uh, it can be any size. So I think you know, we can easily address that. Thank you. We've reached 11 o'clock, so if you want to close this out, and then we'll, we'll respond with, yeah. with questions afterwards. Sounds good. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who attended today. Thank you to Mauricio and Jim for the presentation. Um, for any questions we didn't get to, we will reply to you individually. So give us a little bit of time for that. And finally, I will be manning our web chat today over at cokemodular.com. If you feel like you urgently want to discuss anything or get an answer to your question, hop on over there. We staff it every weekday from about nine to five, sometimes longer. It was a pleasure being your moderator this morning, and we hope to have the pleasure of doing business with you. Thanks very much, Maybe, everyone. Maybe one thing I'd like to add before we close out, you just reminded me that we're going to be Please. doing a, a webinar in December. I think it's right. December 9th. And to that last okay. question, I think that will speak very closely to that, because what we're going to talk about is how Going modular can really assist with concept commercialization and really dealing with that 
really, you know, FBL1, FBL2. So stay tuned for that one. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.